You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. We'd also like to welcome our staffers with our congressional delegation, Bernadette Granger with Congressman Skeen's office. Oh, excuse me, Steve Pierce's office. Beverly Allen with Senator Tom Udall's office. Diane Ventura with Senator Martin Heinrich's office. Our congressional delegation did a great job this year with working everything out on the budget. And we especially appreciate their effort making sure WIP receives sufficient funding to carry on with the recovery effort and prepare for the future. If you'll recall, we began these co-hosted town halls shortly after the February 2014 incidents at WIP. And we're now approaching the two-year anniversary of those incidents. As progress has been made, we've now moved into holding our town hall meetings on a quarterly basis. We'll be following the same format as previous town halls tonight. John Heaton will serve as moderator, and then CBO, CBFO manager Todd Schrader will deliver the update on WIP. We would also like to welcome the Office of Environmental Management's Doug Hentz from Los Alamos, who is here to deliver a report from Los Alamos. Finally, Jim Blankenhorn with Nuclear Waste Partnership will be delivering a presentation on the preparations for the restart at WIP. We have a lot to cover today, but we're, we'll be taking questions from the audience and online at the end of our presentation today. Thank you, and I'll turn things over to John. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And again, want to welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, and Happy New Year. I hope it is prosperous and you're all very, very healthy, most of all. That's, I think that's the most important thing. Nothing else matters. Uh, so with that, we'll get started. Same rules will prevail that have prevailed in the past. We'll, uh, after the presentations, we'll take questions from the people that are here at the meeting in person, and then we'll go to those online. So I want to also welcome every, welcome everyone that's online, and thank you also for being here. So, with that, we'll jump right into the the meeting. Uh, I don't think Doug Hines is is here. Uh, I think he uh, something came up. He couldn't make it. So that part of the agenda will not be followed through with. So with that, uh, Todd. Mr. Schrader, manager of CBFO. Yes, uh, as John said, unfortunately, Doug didn't get a chance to be last night to be there. Since his apologies, he did want to really be there, but uh, an emerging issue up there he had to take care of, and we'll certainly look to bring him back uh, in a future town hall. Uh, and he is excited about coming down here and uh, not only coming to the town hall, but uh, visiting WIPT itself and, and seeing our facilities. Um, so just uh, a little bit more, I'll, I'll make an observation. I, I uh, permanently moved here December 7th, finished my move, and uh, so about a month ago today, and I uh, uh, had to have a little talk with my uh, senior staff about honesty because to a person I heard, don't worry about snow. It comes <laughs> overnight, it's gone by noon, don't worry about it. So um, the challenges we live in. So a um, couple of subjects, this will go quick that we'll talk about, but I, I think it'll be of interest to uh, everyone. Uh, as you know, uh, about a week and a half ago, just for Christmas, uh, there was an announcement that in the Federal Register that there was a preferred alternative to uh, potentially ship six metric tons of non-pit surplus plutonium uh, to the site from the Savannah River site. Uh, a preferred alternative is simply that. It, it means it's being looked at and analyzed. Uh, no decision is made until the record of decision itself is issued by the department, and that can be done no sooner than 30 days uh, after the uh, preferred alternative is published in the Federal Register. The uh, shipment or, or the material itself, for those who are familiar with what we've taken here in the past, it's actually fairly similar to what we've taken from Rocky Flats in, in the past, so it wouldn't be that much different um, in the future uh, if indeed a decision is made to, to ship that there, uh, ship that to us. Go ahead, next slide, please. Um, another area I know uh, everyone has asked about is the permanent ventilation system and the uh, critical decisions associated with that. Uh, about a week and a half ago or so, critical decision one was signed uh, on the 23rd, in fact, of December. 
uh, by the Department of Energy. Uh, that decision in our project management space means that an alternative was selected for the project. Uh, we looked at approximately 24 different alternatives to supply ventilation back up to the rates that we saw um, um, two years ago. The preferred alternative is a new exhaust shaft that is unfiltered um, for the mining operations in, in that circuit within the underground. And then also a new filter building that would go roughly where the filters are now, for those of you uh, familiar site. Fairly large building that would support uh, uh, upwards of a half million CFM of ventilation if needed uh, for the facility. The um, critical decision one simply selects that alternative. It doesn't set a schedule. It doesn't set a firm budget. It, de it defines rough orders of magnitude for both. The baseline and schedule will actually be developed at critical decision two, uh, which is designed to find the baseline. And that'll come in about 12 to 18 months uh, for the project. Uh, for those of you familiar with the legislative process, it, it's technically two capital projects, one for the shaft, one for the, um, uh, for the filter ventilation system. So in, in sort of congressional space, as you see it, you'll actually see two line items for the project. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, I'll just give you uh, what the cost range was, or the rough order magnitude, again, uh, for this was uh, between uh, about 189 and 280 million for the filter ventilation part, and between 81 million and 118 million for the new shaft and, and any associated uh, ventilation equipment that goes with that. We, uh, once the, uh, obviously once the design is uh, matured, which will happen as we're moving towards baseline development, more information will, will come out. Uh, you know, you can imagine now we don't even have the specific place where we would put the exhaust shaft. We have to look at all those. Uh, in, a, in the final design or in the design development phase, all those questions. Next slide, please. Um, interim ventilation system and supplemental ventilation system. Uh, there's a couple articles in the paper, a little bit of discussion about these, these systems. And I want to sort of talk about where we are today. Um, although at one time, early on, there was some uh, thinking that uh, supplemental ventilation system or SVS would be uh, required or run in operation with the IVS or interim ventilation system uh, to support waste and placement operations. Um, now that we've gone through uh, more design efforts and, and more analysis, particularly using our professionals who, who have worked here many years and the modeling tools and taking actual measurements down in the uh, underground, uh, we have come to the conclusion that the interim ventilation system along with the currently running underground ventilation system will be sufficient to uh, meet all the requirements for waste and placement. Uh, no absolute final decision is made on not using the SVS system with the IVS, um, sometimes called decoupling, um, but we feel confident that the uh, interim ventilation system alone, will, uh, along with the underground ventilation system, will meet our requirements. Um, saying that, the IVS system, uh, Mr. Blankhorn will talk a little bit more about it, but uh, right now we're in construction of it. And we're looking to have it operational in the March, April timeframe uh, as we move forward with it. Uh, if, for in, if by chance it didn't provide us the ventilation flow rates we have, there are other mitigation measures we can take in the underground with bulkhead controls and, and, and some of the various configurations we can set up underground uh, with the system to, uh, we believe, meet our requirements if that's needed. But we have high confidence that IBS uh, will meet it. Uh, this also allows us, by the way, to by, by taking the SVS out, it allows us to really concentrate on the safety systems and, and the systems that we need to get the waste in placement. Uh, SVS is important. It's absolutely required for mining operations, but those operations aren't needed for another probably year to 15 months. Sometime in, in 2017 is when we'd have to start mining again. Um, so it, it just allows us to really focus where we really need to focus here uh, to get the waste in placement. Next slide, please. Another area that we've been asked a lot of questions on and an obvious interest is the uh, performance baseline. Uh, it was submitted to us uh, by the contractor in December. We are finalizing the review. We uh, lost a little bit of time over the holidays with uh, some shutdowns, but uh, we're getting very close to approving it. The baseline itself supports a restart of waste and placement operations in 2016, late 2016, uh, at an 80% confidence level. Uh, and that's based on how you do project management and, 
and, and your risk analysis and, and mitigation measures, how you would apply them uh, to the system. Um, again, we're going through the final reviews of it itself. Uh, once we do finalize the review, our intent is to have a workshop. It's my understanding that was done on the previous baseline sometime last year or the year before, uh, where we sit down with uh, interested parties and we'll talk through the details of the, of the schedules and, and uh, the scope, uh, et cetera, of the baseline. So sometime relatively soon, uh, we should start say, making some announcements about when those workshops will take place. Next slide, please. And then uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, budget itself, there's a breakdown. As everyone knows, the omnibus was passed in uh, early December, uh, and the WIP budget was itself was $305 million. Um, and, and there's a breakdown, I won't go into the details of it, uh, of where that money and how it's spent. Uh, the good news is that that amount allows us to continue with all our preparations for waste and placement, allows us to support the capital project, uh, the permanent ventilation, the interim ventilation systems. Um, and, and the other part of, of getting to restart that we, we probably don't talk about as much is the National True Program side of the house, making the changes we need there in our processes and procedures. and and ensuring that we're ready to support the complex when the uh, waste and placement operations do we start. Go ahead, please. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Jim here to talk to uh, some of the more specific parts of, of the restart uh, as we're moving forward. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, John. Mayor Janway. First, uh, first, let me say uh, welcome back to everybody and hope everybody had a, a great holiday season and I wish everybody a happy new year. Uh, 2015 was a great year for us in terms of uh, progress that was made and in terms of recovery. Um, we've continued to make significant progress on bolting operations with, uh, with over 5,500 bolts installed now uh, since November of 2014. And uh, we've got one hybrid bolter uh, in service in the underground, a second hybrid bolter that uh, we'll be taking into the underground later this month to place it into service. Continue to make excellent progress on, on radiological risk reduction. Uh, we've rolled back over 65% over of the underground uh, and we stand to roll back another 35 or 30% 30 uh, here in the next 30 to 45 days. So teams are doing a great, great amount of work and great success on on rolling back uh, the areas in the underground. Well, probably the most significant thing uh, that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, do we control in the clicker or someone yeah, else? Just let me know. I'll let you know, all right. Um, when, we, uh, when we had the events in February of 2014, we spent the first four months, if you'll remember, in a period that we called response, uh, where we, we had to do a number of things uh, put in new alarms, we had to clean the waste hoist tower, uh, we had uh, a number of, of cleanup activities that we had to go through, and we spent the first four months uh, in a response mode. We then moved into a period of time uh, that we declared as a recovery phase, uh, and the recovery phase was about uh, redoing the, the programs and procedures, the training and qualifications of our staff, obtaining new equipment and, uh, and finishing up uh, corrective actions. And uh, we've come a long way to that. We're not quite ready to declare that we're complete with recovery, uh, but we're probably within a month of being able to declare that we are done with recovery and we're gonna move into the final phase. 2016 will be the year that we uh, resume waste and placement at the WIP site. And uh, uh, so we're gonna transition here in the next several weeks into our final phase, which we'll call restart. So what I really want to talk about uh, with you this evening is some of the things and status of some of the, of the restart activities that we've got in front of us. The first one is the interim ventilation uh, system, construction status. Uh, this is uh, what, what Todd was referring to, uh, the IVS. Just as a reminder, this is the, the additional HEPA capacity that we've, uh, we've procured. Uh, this essentially gives us an additional 54,000 uh, cubic feet per minute of filtered capacity in addition to the 60,000 that we have today. So it almost doubles our current capacity. Uh, and if you'll remember, we had a lot of challenges with this system. 
Uh, it was damaged during transport. Uh, we had to do a lot of, uh, of repair and uh, rework and retesting on that. That was completed last summer. Had a number of issues with the ductwork manufacturer where they had to rework a number of the ductwork pieces, but uh, that has now been completed. And uh, last November, we awarded uh, the contract to uh, a vendor to uh, start the installation. Uh, they've completed the installation of, of all of the ductwork supports, and you can see that on, on the picture here. Uh, some of those supports, there were a total of 21, uh, and then they've started to install the ductwork. So they've got about six of the ductwork pieces uh, installed uh, with about 20 or so to go. Uh, we had some challenges with them in December. Uh, they had some, some issues with their hoisting operations and with their uh, hoisting and rigging and crane operations and so we we initiated a stand down with them a safety stand down with them uh, to work with with their corporate folks and with our corporate folks as well as the folks at the site and with the Department of Energy to uh, to understand what those challenges were uh, to make sure that we had corrective actions in place uh, to prevent recurrence and make sure that we had the right people uh, on the job and so uh, over the December months, the, uh, the corporate management of this uh, subcontractor came to the site. Um, they brought with them a number of, uh, of folks, uh, subject matter experts that they've assigned to the project. Uh, we've gone through and developed a corrective action plan with them that we've approved. Uh, and as of uh, uh, Monday of this week, Tuesday, uh, we allowed them to go back to work. Uh, we've also brought in play uh, some of our corporate reachback folks that have expertise in hoisting and rigging. Uh, and so we've got all those folks on site now providing the, the appropriate oversight so they can finish this job. Right now it looks like uh, due to those safety issues and due to the, uh, the weather um, the last week or so of December, uh, we, we're about three weeks behind on this schedule. So uh, right now we had anticipated having this uh, the construction phase of this complete in the in the end of January, early February. It looks like we'll have it have it complete now by about the end of February. Once we've got construction done, then we'll move through a testing phase, then we'll move through a startup phase and put it into operations. Next slide. Another significant uh, milestone that, uh, that that we're very proud of uh, the documented safety analysis. Uh, many of you will remember we've talked about this for several months. Uh, it's been an, evol an activity we've been working on for about a year now. Uh, this is the document that, that lays out, it's a documented safety analysis, and within the documented safety analysis there's a companion document called technical safety requirements. Uh, those documents are the driver for all of our safety management programs. They look at all of the hazards, they look at all of the accidents, uh, they look at all the mitigation strategies and they identify the controls uh, that we need to put in place to be able to operate safely. Uh, so now that that has been completed, we delivered that to the Department of Energy about mid-December, and they're looking at uh, looking at that document now uh, for review and comment. Uh, this was a great collaborative effort between the department and, and NWP. Along the way, we had a, a probably the strongest team in the complex between DOE and, and uh, and the corporate entities uh, working on the development of this document to get it to this point. So uh, it's in good shape um, and, and department now is running through their reviews. We've gone ahead and, and uh, because of the high quality of this document, we've gone ahead and started uh, to work on implementation activities uh, even prior to DOE's approval. And what that really means is that is we're not waiting to go ahead and start to make the, the procedure changes and start to train the workforce. So in December, we stood up a team uh, that took about 120 of our operating procedures, revised those, changed those with the new controls or the revised controls that are in this document. We've still got some more documents to do and we'll finish those uh, this month and then we'll start training and qualifying our workforce uh, later this month to this document. So we're moving forward pretty aggressively on the implementation. Now the final implementation uh, won't, will not occur until the department has, uh, has given us their comments and we've uh, revised or satisfied their comments and then they'll issue what's, what's called a, uh, an SCR, a safety evaluation report. 
uh, that will then give us our formal authorization to, to then begin the implementation of the document. So uh, great, great amount of work that's behind us now. Uh, now we're into the, the, uh, the meat of this, which is the implementation, and we expect, uh, we expect to continue to do that over the next two or three months. Uh, implementation and training will occur, like I said, the training pieces of it and the procedure mods will occur in the month of January. And then we're looking at uh, sometime in the month of February starting up our, our cold operations. Uh, and, and I'll briefly describe cold operations um, when we get back a little bit further in the slide deck. Next slide. Another uh, major success, uh, if you will, we've, we, if you'll remember, we had three accident investigation board reports issued. Uh, out of that accident investigation board report, uh, we had a total of 143 corrective actions identified for NWP, another 98 identified for CBFO, and then there's a handful of, uh, of activities that uh, belong to DOE headquarters and another set of activities that belong to uh, Los Alamos. Uh, so in terms of where we are for, for those corrective actions, as you can see, the Department of Energy is here at uh, Carlsbad has gotten uh, completed 70 of the 98 that, that uh, they were assigned out of those reports. We've completed 121 out of the 143. Those remaining items are all items that uh, are not yet due. They're due to be complete, uh, most of them within the next 90 days. Some of them are post-start activities, most of those associated with the RAD event phase two report. But most of the others are scheduled to be complete in the next 90 days. And so uh, teams made uh, considerable progress on this. Uh, these are the keys to uh, to addressing the issues that were identified uh, uh, in terms of the response to the, both the fire and the radiological event. Um, I would also remind you that we did uh, an extent of condition review on all of our safety management programs uh, about a year and a half or so ago. Um, and as a result of that, we had identified another 600 plus corrective actions that we needed to make to procedures and programs uh, and we're about 95% complete with all of those items as well. So great deal of work that's gone on. Uh, like I said, we'll finish the remainder up here in the next 90 days, those that are, that are required for pre-start, and, uh, and we'll have these officially behind us. Next slide. The readiness activities are, are broken down into several different steps. Um, once we get these items that I've just discussed behind us, uh, then we'll move into the first uh, phase of our readiness activities, which we're calling cold operations. And the best way to describe this is uh, we're going to take about eight weeks. Uh, we're going to give the employees all of the procedures, revised procedures. They'll have completed all their training and qualifications. And for eight weeks, we'll plan evolutions, activities with simulated uh, waste containers. Uh, and we'll allow the workforce every day to practice uh, receiving and emplacing waste uh, in the underground. Uh, again, those will all be simulated waste packages, no, uh, no chemical or radiological hazards. They'll be empty containers. Uh, but they'll have all, they'll have uh, uh, data, we'll take data uh, from other containers uh, to use in the, uh, in the procedure set so they can evaluate that. And we'll exercise them every day. The, the, the sequence of events would be we'd we would issue, at the beginning of the day, the activities that we want to perform. We'll conduct a pre-job uh, around those activities and procedures. We then conduct the activity. We we'll then do a post-job critique of the, uh, of the day's activities. And there'll be a management team that uh, will observe all the ev evolutions conducted that day uh, to do an assessment and provide feedback. And basically, this just gives our operators time to uh, take eight weeks, basically, to practice to get comfortable with the procedure sets, to make sure all, that the procedures work, make sure all the equipment works, uh, and make sure that all of their questions have been addressed in terms of uh, our new safety basis documents and any changes that we've made. Now, in addition to that, we'll, uh, we'll drill, uh, conduct drills and exercises during that period. Some of those will be announced, some of those will be unannounced. And there'll be things like uh, abnormal events, so we'll We'll drill them on, on you know, what will happen if you drop a container. What will you, ha what will you do if, uh, if we have a, a constant air monitor alarm? What will you do if a, if a fire occurs? Those kinds of things. So we'll stage those drills 
uh, and then we'll exercise those during this period again just to make sure that that all of our folks are are both familiar proficient and comfortable with uh, with all of our procedures and all of our responses next slide once we complete that eight week cold operations period then we're going to bring in a team of about 20 to 25 external subject matter experts they'll come on site for two weeks uh, they will observe us doing the same evolutions uh, that I just described during the cold operations they'll observe us for two weeks doing the same types of exercises same types of evolutions same types of drills they'll assess our programs they'll assess our procedures they'll assess our equipment readiness they'll assess uh, our people's performance um, and they'll basically give us a report card at the end uh, that uh, based on all of the uh, safety management programs, all of our functional areas, uh, they'll give us a report card on the health of all our programs. They'll likely have corrective actions that they'll identify, findings that we'll need to address. And so after that two-week period, we'll take about 30 days uh, to address those issues, make the appropriate changes, um, brief the organization, train them on the changes, um, and then at the completion of that, then NWP will make a formal declaration uh, that we are uh, a declaration of readiness. That then allows us to move into the next phase. Next slide, please. You've heard us talk about uh, operational readiness reviews. There will be two operational readiness reviews. So we'll, we'll do the two-week period for the management self-assessment and then once we've done our corrective actions, we'll declare our readiness, and then we'll conduct two operational readiness reviews. Each one of those operational readiness reviews will be 15 to 20 people, uh, two different teams. One will be a contractor team. We'll, we'll bring in folks from around the complex, uh, from all different sites uh, that make up that team. The second team will be a, a DOE team. Again, it will be external. Uh, they'll bring in representatives from Department of Energy from around the complex. The first team that will come in will be the contractor team, and they'll do, we'll do a contractor ORR. What that will look like is very, look very similar to what our management self-assessment looks like. They'll come in for two weeks. Uh, they'll follow us. They'll watch us performing evolutions, simulated waste emplacement. Uh, they'll watch us uh, respond to drills and exercises. They'll look at our programs, they'll look at our equipment, they'll look at our corrective actions from all the Accident Investigation Board reports. And again, at the end of that two-week period, they'll then give us their assessment of our programs and the health of our, of our programs. Again, we expect some, some findings and issues to come out of that. And so following that two-week period will take, again, about 30 days to resolve uh, issues. Again, make changes, train the workforce, uh, on those changes, make sure they're uh, proficient, and then we'll be prepared for the second operational readiness review, which will be the Department of Energy's review, and they'll come in. It'll look very similar to what the contractor ORR looks like. They'll come in again uh, for a two-week period. They'll watch very similar events uh, and activities that uh, we'll have watched during the contractor phase, uh, and they'll, they'll verify and validate uh, that uh, what we said we could do and our performance is adequate. They'll also look at uh, DOE oversight. So CBFO is, has got a, uh, a review part of this as well. Uh, and they'll look at, uh, again, corrective action response. Uh, and again, coming out of that two-week period, we'll then address any pre-start uh, findings that they may have identified. Once we've completed those pre-start findings, uh, we would then make a uh, request to the Department of Energy who would then provide the authority to commence uh, operations and waste and placement. So that's the sequence of events that we'll go through for readiness activities um, and the activities leading up to it. Now, the only other item that I'd mention to you uh, that will be occurring over the next uh, two or three months is we're making uh, a couple of different equipment enhancements. Uh, one of them is to our notification system. Uh, today, as many of you know, we use uh, uh, we use brass tags for accountability and we use a mine phone system and a PA system in the underground for communications and we'll continue to use those systems they're effective they work uh, very well they're compliant but we're also going to move forward with an enhanced uh, system that uh, looks much like a walkie-talkie 
every individual that goes into the underground uh, will be issued one of these uh, walkie-talkies. Uh, this, uh, this system provides uh, a number of different ways to communicate with each individual. It, uh, it sends a, uh, a visual alarm. It's got a light on it that, that uh, will blink different colors. It's got a vibrate uh, mode to it. Uh, it's got an audible alarm mode to it. Uh, and then it also has a, a text screen where we can send messages and the, and the individual will be able to read those messages by text. The final thing that it does, obviously, is it provides two-way communications. And so uh, it's a wireless system it's designed around a, wire, a wireless backbone. Uh, the wireless system that we're installing is, uh, is self-healing, meaning that we can lose several different nodes out of the system, and the system will automatically then link to the existing nodes to provide the coverage. So we'll have, uh, we'll have the ability to communicate uh, with each individual in the underground, regardless of where they're at. Um, so it's, a, it's a, an enhancement to our existing communication system. We're looking to have that uh, on site. Um, uh, the installation will occur in the month of January. It should be operational uh, in February. The second thing that we're doing in terms of enhancements, uh, uh, many of you remember we've talked about fire suppression all of the waste handling equipment has automatic fire suppression. All of the mining equipment had uh, manual fire suppressions. And so we've gone through and identified all of the mining equipment that we're going to utilize for the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, and we're, we are in the process of upgrading all of the fire suppression on that equipment to automatic. Uh, we identified a total of 13 pieces of equipment. I think as of today, we would completed seven of those systems in terms of upgrading them to automatic fire suppression. We'll complete the rest of those over the next 45 days. Um, and then the second thing that we're doing uh, as an enhancement uh, to the underground fire protection is uh, we've identified five different areas in the underground that uh, represent either areas where we have high occupancy, a lot of folks uh, are in those areas, or that have high combustible materials uh, like office areas that have a lot of paper. Um, and in those five areas, uh, we're going to install automatic fire suppression systems. Uh, so that's going to be, uh, that equipment will be on site uh, in the March time frame. And then we've got, uh, once they're installed, we'll have to install some additional bulkheads uh, to segregate those areas. Uh, and that we'll complete that uh, as pre-start activity. So those, those are two of the final uh, enhancement programs that we've got underway in terms of facility modifications. Okay, with that, I think we'll uh, we'll stop for for questions. Uh, first question is on a subject I touched on during the last uh, town hall meeting, and that's accountability. I think we established during that meeting that nobody in DOE apparently was responsible for several decisions, such as the one to, cha to send waste to Los Alamos, uh, fr from Los Alamos to WCS. But um, I was curious, uh, another question that came up on accountability within the DOE system is, apparently the DOE is uh, financially supporting the people who are opposing WIP, specifically Don Hancock and his group, through a foundation that gets money from the DOE and then that foundation passes it on to Don Hancock, it passes it on to the Snake River Alliance, it passes it on to the anti-nuke group at Savannah River, and then these folks travel around the country visiting those sites and have their pictures taken among them with Todd Schrader here at WIP. So I'm curious as to who in DOE is actually responsible for allocating something like $5 million over five years to the anti-nuclear groups that are actually opposing WIP and other uh, DOE projects. The, uh, I, I don't know specifically who uh, is involved in that, but I do know we support stakeholder organizations around the complex uh, um, uh, through various grants. I don't know the specifics that you brought up here, but um, um, certainly we, we always uh, want to hear from uh, stakeholders and understand the needs of the community and needs of the uh, uh, personnel in the community. And so uh, that's probably how this happened. Uh, we can certainly get, get the specifics of the funding if that's a question. Uh, I just don't know off the top of my head. Uh, 
the specifics are on the web, okay? And I think it will surprise a lot of the good supporters of Rick in Kalspa quite a bit that the Department of Energy is actually supporting those people who are acting against Rick and have been acting against it since the beginning of the project. And especially it would be interesting to hear what the rationale for that is. Just as we have not heard any rationale yet for what you mentioned, the CD1, we have not, you have not yet made publicly available either the CD0 decision or the reasons that led, of course, the decisions, yes, but the decision, why, why it was made, how it was made, what was the alternatives considered, there is nothing about that been published. Um, it is a project that will cost on the order of $100 million for the shaft alone, as you earlier mentioned, plus $200 million for ventil other ventilation enhancements. So we're talking about a cool, possibly up to half a billion dollars, which other people have estimated earlier. You're spending my money, and you're not telling me why you are spending it. You have never answered that question. I brought it up several times. So when can we expect that we will actually see a paper that will give us a rationale for deciding that you needed all this stuff. Because I've looked through the budget proposals, I've looked through the budget, the stuff that's on the web, and all that is there is a decision, but it doesn't say why that decision was made. Sure. Um, the, uh, as you mentioned, the, the cost right now to afford a magnitude is roughly $300 million for the two capital projects. Um, as far as documentation, we are right now in the process of preparing some uh, information and, and documents to uh, describe the CD1 decision itself. Uh, we can make those available to people. We're, we're close to having those done, not quite there yet, but uh, going through the final reviews. But we understood, we understand that once the decision is made, people and stakeholders want to understand what was made and, and how it was looked at and the decisions that were made. So uh, I would say relatively soon, within, within hopefully a, a few days even, we should have some documents ready to be released. Okay, good. Any other questions locally? Mary? I have a lot of concern about this snowstorm. And RIP is a pretty important project. And I don't understand why we didn't have any way to clear access roads and why we're depending on the state or the city to do it. Can you explain that? So, so Mary, I, I don't know how much how much information was has been shared, but you know, basically, this was one of the worst storms New Mexico has seen, and from what I've heard, at least the last two decades. And and I think you saw how how bad things were in places like Artesia and Roswell and other areas where they had massive snow drifts. The state basically needed all the emergency management equipment that was available. Uh, they took it and they used it in the areas where there was the highest demand. What, what that left us to do, because we don't have snow removal equipment, uh, what that left us to do was to, was to work with local contractors, which we did, uh, to secure some of their equipment, to clear at least one of the access roads to whip, which they did. Uh, now, we had folks that, um, we always have folks out at the site. I don't, I don't know if you know that. We, have, we always have someone out there. There's always a crew on. And so what happened was the crews that were out there during, during the event just stayed on. Now, you know, we had to, obviously we had to get some additional folks out there to them to provide relief so that they weren't up for 24 hours at a time. But, but we were able to get sufficient folks out. We already had folks out there, uh, and then we were able to get sufficient folks out there to relieve them uh, for the day or two that it took us to get a contract in place to get um, one of the access roads cleared up for us. We had made the request to the state, but quite frankly, we were, we were pretty low priority on their list because they were conducting life-saving activities around, around the state. But, but effectively, that's what happened. They, they effectively came in, and they needed all the resources, and they took them. So we went, went, then went the route of working with subcontract, local people in the community that had that type of equipment, and we subcontracted directly with them uh, to come do the work for us. I don't know if that quite answers your question. I'm just sort of giving you the sequence of events we went through. Okay. Any others? 
Let, let me ask a, a question if I could. Uh, there was uh, an article in the Journal of Science on uh, the UT investigation of, of uh, deep salt domes and uh, there was a peripheral reference to, to WIP in that article, which I think was definitely un, uh, had no relation to WIP, but at any rate, could you or somebody maybe? Actually, we uh, do have someone who, who could look at this, uh, Mr. Abe Van Luke, I think, and okay. who so, can answer that. Abe, could you maybe catch us up on that a little bit? Yes, uh, as a uh, regulated facility, we take any challenges to our safety bases very seriously. So as soon as we heard about this uh, article in science, we contacted our subject matter experts, I did, and uh, got them to review the article and write us their impression of the article. Now, as uh, Norbert was pointing out to me before we started, the article only mentions salt repositories in two places. But the problem is that it uh, calls into question in a news release, talks about the waste isolation pilot plan directly, and calls into question whether or not enough uh, evaluation has been done about its long-term stability. Uh, the, one of the main authors says, if it's an existing nuclear waste storage site, you may want to reevaluate this with this new information. Uh, and then uh, the, the lead author of the article, our discovery encourages others to ask questions about the safety of current and future disposal sites. So this is a direct challenge to us. And in the uh, actual science article, um, it says uh, some, okay, Deep geologic storage sites for nuclear waste are commonly located in rock salt to ensure hydrologic isolation from groundwater. This is basically saying people select salt because it doesn't let water to go through. If water went through, it wouldn't be there. The design of nuclear waste repository should guard against deformation driven fluid percolation, which is what they studied. Now deformation driven talks about deforming of the salt because of tectonic and other activities that are happening in the earth. It just so happens that location is very important. The salt that we are in, we have shown in this characterization phase, has been stable since it was laid down about 225 to 250 million years ago. The Germans immediately pounced on this article too because it indirectly affects them just as well, even though they were not named because they, are, they have an existing repository and they have a proposed repository in SALT. And so they have been collaborating with Sandia to come up with a joint response to this article. Now one of the Sandians had a brilliant idea and said that instead of writing an attack article saying that this was an irresponsible taking of a little bit of information and shoving it onto the issue of nuclear waste disposal, Rather than do that, why don't we collaborate with the University of Texas people and write a joint response to science that says they recommended certain specific things should be looked at to check whether or not a salt deposit is stable over geologic time. We looked at those specific recommendations in our site characterization documents from the 80s and 90s and we saw that we did exactly the work that's being recommended. So what we're going to do on the 12th is I'm orchestrating a conference call with the University of Texas people, with the Germans and with us, and we're going to calmly talk through their recommendations and show them and give them references to where we did this work to show that we are not questioning their work. It's good science. It was just inappropriately extended to our case. So what we're hoping to do is convince them that it would be a win-win situation for all concerned and put this issue to bed if they would acknowledge in that response article that they have looked at the work we have done and yes, we filled the bill, we have shown to their satisfaction that this is a very stable uh, site. Now in the article itself, they say that typically this would not really uh, pertain to a bedded salt formation. 
But of course, that kind of leaves you hanging as to what, whether it would pertain to a domal salt formation. And the one thing that I think is interesting to note is that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is using four salt domes right along the Mississippi, uh, no, uh, Mississippi and Louisiana, right, right along the Gulf Coast. And these guys studied domes inside the Gulf. Those domes are not stable. The ones outside the Gulf are very stable. And in fact, there has been no known penetration of the salt by the oil, which is why it's a very capable system. And they go so deep that the uh, temperature difference between the bottom and the top of the oil reserve naturally keeps convection going and keeps the oil mixed. So this is very good evidence that location is very important when you select a repository site. And we think at WIP we will make the case that we have done our homework, we have shown that the processes they're talking about just simply do not apply here. And we hopefully will publish that in science as a joint UT SNL German organization article. That'll be a first, I think, in the Journal of Science that we have the proponent and the opponent jointly saying, yeah, this doesn't really apply here. So that's our, that's our hope. If not, we will write a response ourselves. Uh, thank you for that update. That was, that was great. I'm glad to hear the collaborations going on. And I think it will mean a lot in terms of, you know, the continued confidence in what, we, what we're using here uh, as our salt repository. If I can add my support to, to what uh, Abe just said, uh, and I have some pers I had a little bit of personal involvement in this issue. Actually, some German colleagues, a Professor Urai, who is quoted in the, um, in the article, or is referenced in that article, uh, he and I had a discussion a few uh, international meetings ago on this topic, and I actually brought up to him that, yeah, this was interesting scientific stuff, but unless you actually uh, say over what domains or what ranges, what distances these permeabilities are generated, it really doesn't matter. Everybody knows that we are creating permeabilities by deformation around the edges of salt domes or around the uh, excavations in any salt or potash mine. So uh, the sheer fact of, or the plain fact that uh, some permeabilities are there in the margins of these things is completely irrelevant to, wa to waste disposal. And we argued back and forth quite a bit uh, about that. Uh, but uh, in essence, it boils down to this is an old hat, cold coffee from way back when, spilled milk. And these guys, at, at, uh, I, I can speak a little bit more bluntly about, the, about it. These people at, at the University of Texas basically regurgitated stuff that had been done before, expanded its reach maybe by an inch, and then sold it as something new. And then the media picked it up and made a big issue out of it. It's, it's, a, it's a tempest in a teapot. Anyway, thank, thank you very much for that, that update. I think it's important for everyone to hear that, to know that. And then the results from your collaboration, I think, will be very interesting to hear about as well. So, and the results of that. Okay, I've got eight questions right now. I've had about 17 um, participants um, throughout the evening. Uh, first question for Mr. Schrader particularly. What will the $19 million for transportation be spent on this fiscal year when no waste is being transported to WIP? Um, the, the transportation program itself, uh, we maintain our uh, agreements with our states and, and various training uh, requirements for first responders, et cetera. Uh, in addition, you know, as part of waste, getting ready to go to waste and placement, you now have to start looking at uh, shipments restarting uh, after waste and placement uh, operations begin, of course, first waste we're going to uh, in place is what's in the waste handling building. But it's getting ready to, uh, to support those shipments down the line and maintaining our agreements with the states. And, you know, let, let me comment also, in, in this part of the world where oil and gas activity has been extremely uh, active uh, and, and there's every, every person that has a CDL, has been hired. 
In fact, I think they've probably tried to hire some of the people away from uh, the transportation companies that are contracted with WIP. And once you, once you lose them, it's just virtually impossible to get them back. And these are really highly qualified people. They've never had a moving violation in order to, in order to drive for WIP. So these are people that are really extraordinary and very difficult to hire and very difficult to get. And on top of that, uh, I think you have contracts with those companies that uh, you can't just walk off from. So, No, no, it, it, it's a good point. You always have to maintain that capability because, as you said, if you lose the drivers, um, it, it takes quite a while to uh, reconstitute that capability. Uh, there was a question if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more about the stand-down reason in December and um, whether or not there was any sort of punitive response to that. I assume you're talking the, uh, for the interim ventilation system. Uh, I don't remember this. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think the question is referring to, uh, to the IVS system. I mentioned that we brought in a uh, subcontractor and we had a stand down in, in December. Uh, they had a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of issues. One, uh, one event was, uh, was during a, a crane operation where they had, uh, they didn't have the, uh, the, the balance on the crane, uh, correct. And, and, uh, so we had some issues with how they had managed that evolution. Uh, they had, uh, brought in a load of, uh, of gravel and had, um, uh, backed into their one of their their administrative trailers, but again, it just showed a, a, a lack of attention to detail in terms of, of safety. Um, we had some issues with uh, with a, a rigging strap that uh, that broke while they were moving uh, some equipment, uh, which uh, didn't cause any damage to any 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 equipment, but uh, could have caused uh, an injury had that had that strap hit somebody, and so. Uh, we, we called a stand down. Uh, we asked for changes in their procedures. We, uh, we directed changes in their, in their management staff and their safety staff and their supervision. And, uh, and we, they, uh, they, they made all those changes. They've also made some changes um, to, uh, to their subject matter expert um, base that's available. They, they've assigned their corporate uh, safety manager to the to the project uh, for the, the remainder of the project as I mentioned their corporate management team came in their president CEO their uh, COO all came in to not only talk to us but to talk to their their team uh, they're doing some additional uh, human performance training uh, with their with their workforce uh, and, and in addition to that we've we've developed our own corrective actions uh, NWP and CBFO both have um, uh, jointly come up with some corrective actions to provide some additional oversight uh, over those evolutions, and we've uh, we've also brought in some some uh, nationally recognized subject matter experts on on hoisting, rigging, and crane operations, so so they can provide uh, some additional oversight and assistance to the team to try to identify things before they occur, or at least to uh, to mitigate the risk uh, of, of an event occurring. So uh, those, those were the sort of the nature of the events that occurred and some of the things that we did uh, in December and early January to get them resumed. Second. Um, we have multiple questions about the uh, public availability of the DSA and technical safety requirements, whether that will be available to the public and how. Yeah, uh, once approved, the, the DSA, uh, our practice is they, they could be publicly released documents. They, uh, they certainly are a core document for the site, and so uh, for transparency, uh, I, I believe we would look into it. Now, saying that, we have to get through the approval process. We're still working through that right now, and that's uh, still a little ways away before we get that done. But we will certainly look into uh, uh, making those publicly available. I think. How would they be accessed on the web page or um, library or? Uh, traditionally, I think in most sites, I thought we actually put them on web pages, but I, I don't know. We'd have to look into the specifics on, on the best way to do that. But you'll, you'll make that public whenever. We'll, we'll figure out a way to. to Should I continue? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's a request for an update on the, 
the, the nitrate salt containing drums that were shift offsite, uh, had there been any correction action steps taken place regarding them? You're talking at WCS? Stuff that went to WCS. Um, we're, it, to be honest, that's probably more a Los Alamos question uh, to ask, but um, um, I'm, I, I think there's been discussions, but I couldn't give a specific update. Yeah, there's, uh, nothing physically has been done to the containers yet. Um, both Los Alamos and WCS are working uh, jointly, but they're working on plans to treat the waste. I th most likely, the first site that will actually do any kind of treatment will probably be Los Alamos at Los Alamos with the waste they have there, and then once they've got the proven technology, uh, then they'll probably move that technology to WCS to deal with their waste. But I'm speculating, but that's probably what will happen. But nothing physically has happened with any of the waste at Lanel or at WCS at this point. Uh, there was an Eddy County Sheriff's Department uh, press release uh, dealing with the uh, December 27th death at the website. Uh, there was a, a question I received earlier today, if you could provide an update on that. Well, first I want to just say, uh, you know, our, our condolences go out to the family. Uh, we, uh, unfortunately, very tragic incident. We lost uh, a member of our, of our WIP family, a, a, a member of this community, a family man, a great, a great individual that uh, meant a lot to, uh, to all of us. Um, but, but out of uh, respect for uh, his family and in accordance with their wishes, uh, really not at, uh, at uh, liberty to say anything more than what was in the press release, which is uh, there's an ongoing investigation. Uh, there was no uh, indications of foul play, uh, but, but they've got to go through that investigation and complete it's just standard protocols. Um, so I really can't offer anything more than what was, what was in the obituary that came out in the paper and what's been put out in the paper and by the family at this point in time. Oh, yeah, out in order. Different topic. Um, again, uh, we are the owners of WIP, we the taxpayers, and everything that's done at WIP is done on our dollar and is done on our behalf. Therefore, we should be able to uh, access all information as long as it isn't, as it isn't classified, as long as it isn't, as it isn't classified secret or any, any other way. So I encourage you to put more stuff onto the web. And as I have mentioned before to some cognizant individual, uh, individuals, I should say, uh, there's a lot, or there's quite some information, quite a lot of information on, on the web website that pretends to be information but isn't, such as uh, cover letters for reports, but the reports aren't there. Okay? So uh, when you post something like the DSA or anything like that on there, don't just, cover, don't just post cover letters, post the documents as well. And if you dig into the audit reports, you see the cover letters for every, report, for every audit report, but you don't see the audit report. Well, that's useless, okay? I don't care who writes to whom. I care about the substance of the report. So in that context, uh, I've brought up several times that um, uh, WIP authors that publish papers are doing that on our dime. Uh, they are not entitled to any copyright because they're either working directly or as contractors for the government. So there's no copyright uh, violation. These papers, all conference papers by WIP authors, should be posted on the website. And specifically, the Waste Management 15 papers and also the upcoming Waste Management 16 papers and all other conference papers. Now, when I was working at WIP, there was actually a policy that every WIP author who had written the paper with the permission and the approval, etc., of every of everybody who had to give approval, had to give a copy of that to the library. Apparently, that has fallen into disuse. So I would encourage you to tighten up those policies and so that all these articles and all these papers and all these reports are accessible to members of the public. They are the ones who are paying for them. They are entitled to be able to get a hold of them when they contact the WIP library. OK. We've heard, heard that complaint numerous times, and maybe we can fix, maybe we can fix it. So, so uh, in fairness, you know, Todd is new. And uh, we actually, we've talked to Todd about this recently. 
and uh, we're going to he's, he's taking it on as an action we're going to commission a team to to figure out in order what it is that we're not putting on what things we should be putting on those because we'll like we don't put on. well Waste but 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 there may be others so we'll, we'll we're going to take a comprehensive look at this and we'll see you know where we can fix some of the gaps that you've identified so give 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 us a little bit of time uh, we know you let us know which one's on May I continue? Yeah, presently I have three more questions. Um, there's a question about all the snow, basically. With all the extra moisture in the area, is, are there any concerns about seepage or other problems um, into the mine, et cetera? No, uh, no there aren't any concerns. It's, uh, it's, it's just another, um, uh, it's another avenue, if you will, for moisture to, to seep down into the to the to the surface, and then eventually, some of that will, will move to the perch perch tables that we have, and some of that will will eventually migrate into the into the shafts. But we have that as a routine activity that occurs all the time naturally. So this isn't going to cause us any additional concerns. It's not going to cause really any additional um, uh, capacity problems or anything like that. So um, there's really no no concern with the extra snow. Okay. Oh, I'm just going to read this as is to me. What is the postulated impact of all the many wells drilled in and around WIP that were not there 249 million years ago and whether affect the stability of the salt bed? Zero. <laughs> and Norbert's answer is zero. I think we would agree with him. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think maybe the basis of this question is a lot of folks um, around, around the world have seen through fracking operations, they've perhaps seen some destabilization as a result of of, uh, of those fracking operations and, and those kinds of things. We we've got a fairly defined geographical area for our facility. Uh, it's got some some buffer areas and standoff areas for where uh, wells can be drilled and how close to our boundaries they can be be drilled. And there are ongoing studies. Um, We've got some folks at Sandia and other places that continue to evaluate uh, the impacts, if any, of of both drilling operations, fracking operations, and and then the removal of of oil from that leave you know um, pockets in the area. What what that might do to destabilization. So that's an ongoing exercise for us. And and as far as I know, nothing nothing negative has ever come out of those evaluations. Okay, I've got there's a, there, there's a team of Sandia and BLM right. and the mining companies as well as the oil and gas companies that meet routinely and uh, they evaluate what's going on in the whole area and impacts in the area. And uh, it's a very scientific kind of endeavor that they engage in. And uh, I think that uh, the results of that have been proven to be very effective, and they're, they're making decisions about where wells can go and where they can't go. And uh, one of the de destabilization issues that I think is most prevalent is not about the drilling itself or the fracking, but it's the disposal of the, uh, of the water that's generated from, from oil and gas production. I've only got one more question. I'm just going to read it as is and let you tackle it. Can you still say that as of now with the revised DSA that there are no safety limits at WIP? No safety limits? I think what they're referring to is, is, is there safety limits have a very specific definition. Uh, they're usually there for reactors. We, we are not a reactor. Um, we don't have safety limits. What we have is we have controls. So we have the next level down. So yes, the answer is yes. We have no safety limits for our operations at WIP. What we do have is credited safety class and safety significant controls that we implement, which we've always had and will continue to have under the new DSA structure. OK. Um yeah, I, I believe that was. Uh, there was just a follow-up question about the the sinkholes in the area, whether that has anything to do with snow. I'm, 
the, the karst features in the area, if that's a concern. I, I, I thought you addressed that. But. I, yeah, I got nothing on, on sinkholes associated with the snow, so I'd, I'd have to defer to someone else on that one. That's all good. Okay. Okay. Uh, recently, the workers at WIP got a 14% pay raise. They also got bonuses for what reason I'm not really sure of $1,800 and if you multiply that times 250 people that's like a half a million dollars so I'm getting real worried about the budget here and how this works into your budget so the um, the 14 percent was over a four-year period so it's not 14 percent in the first year it's it was split out over different over four years the uh, the funding uh, for all that is is factored into our budget request, and it also comes uh, in a in a separate pot of money that comes from the Department of Energy every year. Uh, they issue the, the pot of money that pays for salaries, pay raises, and promotions. That comes out of a different a different funding source, different pot of money. Uh, so there's no there's no impact on the amount of money that we have to operate the site. It doesn't. We don't decrement uh, that amount of money by that amount. So, so I, there shouldn't be any concerns. I don't know, Todd. You want to? No, I, I agree, um, and I think you characterize it right. It, it is over a four-year period uh, as part of the uh, uh, collective bargaining uh, process with the workforce. And the. Uh new shipments of plutonium that you were discussing earlier, Mr. Schrader. Uh, can you kind of elaborate about what exactly that is? is? Can you give us a code on it so I'll be able to look it up and see, you know, the radiation on it? Uh, not off the top of my head. Um, to be honest, we would, uh, 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 there's a general description in the Federal Register of the document where it talks about the preferred alternative itself. Um, and, and then at, if and when a record decision was uh, posted, then we would start planning and looking at the material in a lot more detail uh, and, and, uh, for it. So uh, I apologize. I, I'm just not that familiar with it. I don't know if you have any more. Yeah, Mary, I don't know off the top of my head, but this document that's in the yeah. reference in the presentation, I can give you a copy of the slide if you want to. It's got the title of the document. It will have that information. I was just going to say, in, in the presentation that, that Todd had, there he has the actual front page of that document, so it gives you the title and the document number. It will have the information that you're, you're looking for, Mary. And there's a lot of information in here, but it'll, it'll, you'll have to search it. But it will give you the plutonium type, and it'll give you the quantities, and those kinds of things will be in this document. Um, and it'll be in the NEPA, the, the, the NEPA homepage if you, if you search NEPA. NEPA on the on the web, you'll also get to, to this document, or you'll get to a, their homepage. You'll be able to find this document. The uh, Nuclear Energy Agency of uh, the European countries apparently has uh, scheduled a meeting uh, on lessons learned from WIP from the accidents and operational safety of nu on, on of nuclear facilities. Um, this uh, meeting has been postponed, but I heard it's going to be rescheduled. And apparently about half a dozen uh, DOE and other folks, some of them actually local here, are uh, supposed to speak there. The uh, title of that uh, seminar, well, so they're all going to travel to Paris and give those presentations at our expense. But um, the title of that, um, of that seminar uh, does not mention anything about mines. And I, th I, I will just bring up one item that I brought up before. I believe one of the biggest problems that WIP has had over the last, oh, let's say, 15 years, and uh, specifically expressed in the um, in the fire uh, incident that we had, was that we have had a focus, an almost exclusive focus, on nuclear safety, which actually trumped everything else. It did that when the um, uh, when one drum was put into WIP about eight years ago and had to be retrieved at the behest of the then uh, NMED secretary and the governor of this lovely state. 
um, or the lovely governor, the lovely then governor of the state, I should say. Um, and it was again expressed, uh, the supremacy of nuclear safety was expressed in the inappropriate nuclear safety style response to a non-nuclear accident, specifically the fire. So I would urge anyone who goes to that meeting in Paris uh, to actually um, uh, make very clear that maybe uh, one significant problem that we had at WIP was not so much a nuclear problem, but a problem of mistaken priorities that led actually to the worsening of the consequences of the fire that we had underground. That, that is made very clear. If anyone else should learn, from, should learn anything from WIP, they should learn the right stuff. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, Abe. Just a slight clarification to Norbert. The Nuclear Energy Agency approached DOE about having this meeting and offered to pay the costs for bringing people over. So this is not your taxpayer money at work. Okay, any other questions? None online. We will call the meeting to a halt then and, and uh, thank everyone for being here. We really appreciate it. I think some good topics were discussed and it's pretty exciting about the progress that's being made and uh, where we're going and I think we're you know, getting CD1 finally done and moving through the process will be will be pretty exciting and uh, as soon as Paul gets EPA to, to uh, come up with a conclusion, we'll be off and going. <laughs> so thanks again for being here and again, Happy New Year.